Greetings citizens of Nerdropolis. Sean Todd here, the mayor of Nerdropolis, and on this episode of Real Insights, my guest is Liza Johnson, the director of Saving Bikini Bottom, the Sandy Cheeks movie. Howdy, Liza. Great to meet you. Great to meet you. I love your background. <laughs> I came ready. But uh, Saving Bikini Bottom, the Sandy Cheeks movie, is such a fun movie, and I'm glad Sandy finally gets her moment to shine. Uh, super excited, and I love every moment of it. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm really happy with it. And I also love her. She's she's pretty much my favorite squirrel. <laughs> yes. I spoke to Carolyn the other day who voices Sandy, who is truly Sandy Cheeks. Uh, what excited you most about directing this movie? Well, you know, I read it during COVID and I just thought it was the funniest thing I'd ever read. And and it's really just very pure. I was just like, this is the funniest thing I've ever read. And that is a very strong magnet for me. And so, um, and I also thought, you know, what's weird, I've never animated anything, but I actually know how to do this movie, um, largely because since I started working more in television, I've had a lot of really good instructors, you know, like um, a lot of people like are in improv in college, or they write for the college comedy paper or something like that. That was not me. And so since... I've been doing more TV. I've just had a lot of gracious people showing me how to do what they do. And I would say like in this hand to hand way, giving me a tradition, which is the same one that SpongeBob comes from, you know? So, so I, I, for example, I worked for Netflix on a Barry Sonnenfeld show, um, a series of unfortunate events. And he is very different from the SpongeBob franchise, but he is very maximalist like the franchise. And I think that he has himself learned a lot from vaudeville, which I think the franchise also has. Um, and he also gave me insight into a way, I mean, just from learning from him, I didn't call him and be like, what should I do or whatever. But like, but when I learned from him, it, it made me able to think of a way that we could shoot the show with a lens that also resembles the world that it comes from, which is drawn, you know, not with a lens. And so, so I I learned so much from him and just also other people who are like, oh, it's funny if it's on the third floor, but not funny on the second floor because there's no danger in falling off the second floor. That was an Alec Berg comedy knowledge drop just to give credit where it's due. But like, and I'd be like, huh, you know, and then I'd go and tell the actor and the actor would be like, that's vaudeville, baby, because they all know the tradition, right? And and just out of kindness, they they kind of exposed me to have the knowledge of the tradition that that SpongeBob comes from. And so then I felt weirdly like I read this funniest script I've ever read. And I was like, oh, I actually know how to do this. Yeah. And it's great to have your, you know, your fingerprints now on this franchise that's been around for forever, which is amazing. Uh Sandy Cheeks is a beloved character in the SpongeBob universe. What do you think makes Sandy Cheeks such an iconic and beloved character? And how did you aim to expand on that in the film? Oh, what a great question. I mean, I think everyone loves Sandy because she's different from a lot of the other characters, you know, like she's not as grouchy as Squidward and she's she's very, very engaged in doing science, which I don't think SpongeBob is. SpongeBob is more engaged in like the sensory world and how it feels when bubbles co go past him and, you know, things things that I think are actually also really important, but they're not science, right? And um, And so I think like her focus on having friends, caring for her friends, and also pursuing her goals is very special within the franchise. And um, and I think it also is the core of the story that I read, you know, where a young squirrel leaves home to realize her dreams and become the squirrel she was meant to be. And that causes some consternation or possibly not total approval from her biological family. She creates a whole new world that she really cares about and that cares about her and, and has a whole community that is truly that she truly belongs to. And then when that gets taken, she knows what she has to do. And I think a lot of people experience, you know, challenges on the road to becoming the person that you're meant to be. And and for me, it was really elegant the way that this movie lets us see the ways that she's addressed those challenges and then gives her the opportunity also to um, improve the, the context, you know, and like 
not only save her chosen family, but to reunite and integrate with the the family she came from, which I think is really moving for me. I'm moved by it. Yeah, we see a lot that we don't know from the show. Uh, yeah. I fell in love with Sandy once I knew she was a Texan because I'm a fellow Texan. So that was also a big point uh, for me having being a fan, being a big fan of hers. But uh, did you have any other particular inspirations or influences that helped shape your vision for this movie? Uh, maybe some other stuff, you know, you grew up, maybe you saw that you just thought, you know, this is something I want to implement in this film or just something of recent, maybe while you're reading the script saying, oh, this is something maybe I can bring over to here. Well, we kind of would do a combination of things where, um, I think the core, my way into this kind of vaudeville aesthetics was the Muppet show. That was like a very formative show for me as a child and throughout my life. What's not to like about the Muppet show, you know, and I constantly think like, oh, that person's like animal or, oh, like, oh, that's like Gonzo because they're flying through the background on a, because they got shot out of a cannon, you know, and, and I see other films that, that really are maximal in, their nature, like like Stephen Chow movies or something, like where there's also always someone getting shot out of a cannon in the background, and I I think like these these traditions are ones that we would draw on, and then also with the story team, you know, we we kind of built a common language that comes both from animation and from lensing stuff, but also a lot of times we would be like, okay, what if it's like the eye in in Psycho when Janet Lee's on the floor or you know, like, like where the same lingua franca that you would use in a live action movie is still the reference, it's still the same grammar for an animated film. And so when, when we were working with the story team, we would still be like, okay, they're going to walk in there like reservoir dogs or whatever. Like, I mean, I don't know that we actually put that in the movie, but it's an example of things that are iconic in live action are still iconic when you draw them, I guess. And that's what really makes movies fun in general when they pull from others and kind of pay homage to that. So, which is really fantastic. And, you know, this is a hybrid film, which I'm so intrigued by hybrid films. They're, they seem like impossible to make it, but we're making them. What are some of the unique challenges of working with this combination, uh, especially with the live action elements and implementing that and just combining them? Um, I mean, I think that the, the biggest challenge really was just us all building a common language. Um, and also certain practices are really quite different. Like in, in live action, once it's in the can, it's in the can, you know, and, um, in animation, people never stop writing. They're like, oh no, Liza, this is how we find story. And I'm like, I liked the story. You wrote it. It was good. Let's, what if we did that story? And they're like, no, we can, we can plus it. And so I learned a lot about plussing and it turns out to be amazing because, we shot all these plates and backgrounds and things that couldn't change, but anytime someone could make it better as we went through the rest of the animation, of course we did. And by we, I mostly mean Piero Peluso, who's a, a, a gentleman uh, and a god among men. Yeah, it's really fun when you combine all the elements. And that's what makes SpongeBob at times fun when there's the our element, the human element that goes into that world. And when you combine, you know, Bikini Bottom with the real world, it's really fun. And that's the most exciting part of the whole franchise in general. Uh, do you have a favorite scene from the film that you got to d- direct? Um, what was your, maybe one of your favorite ones that you, I know there's probably tons, but if you could pick one. I mean, I really love when Sandy's with her family inside the tricked out um, El Camino. I think that scene is really beautiful and it kind of gives me very, a lot of feelings of closeness to her. So I love that. Um, and when we were working with the actors, a lot of stuff was really fun. Um, finding out about Wanda's talent for physical comedy and for going big or going home was really delightful. Um, and Ilya and Maddie were both people I've worked with before. And it was, it was wonderful for me to see them become a team, you know, and to really be reactive to each other, um, which I think is really nice because, you know, in this type of visual effects palette, they can't, they can only react to my voice where I'm like, okay, a squirrel's running down your shirt and now they're on the back and now they're on the front and now they're swinging at you on a rope. Okay. Now they're here. Now they're there. Look at this, look at that. And, and they have my voice to react to, but that's, it's not as rich of a bandwidth as having a person be there, you know? And so, um, I feel really 
grateful that we were able to let the, those actors react with each other and, and with my voice, because it, I think it can be really hard to just be in a, a vacuum and try to imagine the right timings and where, where things are. And everyone, everyone was really game for that. And so I really lucked out. You're telling me you didn't lock everyone in and just put a squirrel in there. <laughs> well, I did. I did. I did. Say, this is where you're going to stand. Cause I had already drawn it, you know, yeah. and if something didn't work, we would change it. But most of the time we did the thing that was on our storyboard. Yeah. And Piero was with us, so if something needed to change, he could reboard it. But mostly, we shot what we planned to shoot, and um, and we did in every just like you would do in any VFX movie, but cuter. We would um, shoot a reference at the beginning of every take or every shot, really, not every take. But we would be like, "This is where the sponge is going to go," and we had a squirrel on a stick, and we would show show with kind of puppets where everyone was going to be and what they should be looking at, and. And then those references get used again later when the animators are like, wait, where were they going to put the squirrel? And they can see from the from the footage what our intentions were. No, I love learning stuff like that. Those little nuggets and how y'all put that together is, is really brilliant. Uh, you mentioned Wanda Sykes. I'm a big time Wanda Sykes fan. I actually did not know she was in this film. I didn't really look up anything. I watched it. I was like, whoa, what happened? Where How did I miss this memo? Uh, also, you know, there's other comedy icons in my eyes, you know, with Johnny Knoxville and Craig Robinson. Uh, can you talk about their enthusiasm to be part of the film, and especially about this franchise and bringing the first, you know, Stanley Cheeks movie to life? 100%. It was so great. Like, Wanda was thrilled to, like, get to enter this universe, and she took it so seriously, but also she's a very joyful and funny person, so she took it seriously, but also frivolously, you know, and and we would try constantly, I'd be like, find the line, try to be too big. And we found it like twice, because it's almost not a category that exists in this world, you know, and, um, and then Johnny, I, I know from another film. And when I read the script, of course, I thought of him, and I wouldn't be surprised if the writers did too, although I, I don't remember if I asked them, but Randy Cheeks loves everything that Johnny Knoxville loves, you know, like, um, evil Knievel stuff and running from the fuzz. And like, it just is the type of character that I think Johnny embodies. And I also think um, it's funny, the one person who reached out to me about this movie, curiously, is the um, chief film curator of the Museum of Modern Art. And it is, don't take it from me, it is his position that that Johnny and Jackass are the true inheritors of the full tradition of physical comedy. and and. I think that's kind of irrefutable. And and I think that also he's a pretty self-aware person. And when he saw a character that is like him, he was just like, I got this, you know? And Craig, I had also worked with on what we do in the shadows. And I just, I think he's so, he has a lot of range, but one thing he's very good at being is warm and affable and everything you want in your squirrel father, you know, squirrel daddy. He's a squirrel daddy. I love that. Uh, I had a great time with this film. Hopefully we get more from Sandy, more spinoffs. I absolutely love the direction of this franchise after so many decades, a couple of decades now. It's amazing. And thank you so much, Liza. Thank you for having me. Once again, this is Sean Taj, the mayor of Nertropolis, and stay tuned for more movie news, reviews, interviews, and trailers. <laughs>